Well, hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us today for week 27 of our weekly financial roundtable for schools. Remember, money isn't the most important thing in life, but it's like oxygen on the gotta have it scale. So I'm Tom Kuhn from CUNITY, and we're here to help students um, and everybody actually in beauty and wellness uh, not only earn great money, but do what they love and have an amazing quality of life. Uh, we have uh, we've introduced our Money by Cunity course, which is financial success training, and it's really designed to help make what's complicated, overwhelming, and confusing to a simpler path to greater prosperity. Uh, using the new rules, which is simple, visual, and actionable, especially appropriate for a creative mind. Uh, to prosper, manage your ATM, your attention, time, and money. And one of the things that um, we want to acknowledge is that your time is precious. So we appreciate you joining us today. And we certainly hope that you get some light bulb moments. Uh, right. Last week's guest was Gordon Miller, a harebrained uh, CEO. Um, a great session on some research that recently came out by the Professional Beauty Association. Uh, Gordon had some really great insights to bring this study alive, to make it relevant. And um, uh, so I love that session. It is recorded. Uh, it's stored on YouTube. If you haven't seen that episode or if you'd like to see it again, uh, go to our YouTube channel and you can check it out. This week's guests, we have Lauren Moser and Roderick Samuels. Uh, we're so glad to have them. Uh, my opening quote, I kind of woke up with this is always believe something wonderful is about to happen. Maybe something wonderful is about to happen because of some light bulb moments that might come from uh, Roderick or Lauren. Um, I attribute this quote to be an unknown. If I'm wrong and somebody Googles it, shame on me, I'll give proper credit, but I just love this quote. Um, again, past recordings are posted um, in our Plan for Profits. It's a course that we have also on YouTube. Uh, shout out to our sponsors, including Pivot Point, who are our partners in crime um, with the Money by Community course, uh, financial literacy for forward thinking schools. Uh, this curriculum addresses what we believe to be the cornerstones to financial literacy especially as it relates to students in career colleges, uh, beauty, wellness, barbering, nails, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we hope you become a money school. You can go to communityforschools.com and book a demo. Uh, also shout out to Lightheart Sanders, uh, who are also sponsors of this CPAs. Um, they are there to help you with your compliance needs and other needs that would come from a great CPA firm. These are great humans. I've had a chance to get to know Jared and um, um, totally appreciate uh, getting to know them and for their sponsorship. Uh, again, we hope you have some light bulb moments today. The Nine Grid is one of our core visual thinking tools that is available to come up with uh, what your light bulb moments are. Uh, it is a way to mind map, storyboard, or create a step by step. Um, whether it's a recap in a call like this, or we actively use it in our curriculum. Uh, so a, a couple things before we welcome our guests here. Uh, have you had your State of the Union yet? Uh, have you had your summit? Uh, January is the time of year to answer questions for your team. Uh, those questions really are incumbent on leadership to provide the clarity that's needed for an organization to move forward. Uh, we just had our we called it the State of the Union on Monday night. It was awesome. Uh, we had an opportunity and we follow a format. It's called the three C's. It's a focusing system uh, that goes through the importance of getting closure, uh, clarity and confidence. These are the things that create focus and clarity as a more organization moves forward. So basically the format um, that we like to see, whether it's a State of the Union, a summit or team meeting uh, where you really communicate um, the DNA of your company for 2022. First of all, it's where are we? Uh, and included in this is a recap of the prior year, a great opportunity to mark the end 2021, to create closure, 
Uh, there's great activities that would allow um, that to happen. So many companies just go from one year to the next to the next year, and they don't really take that time to mark the end and create closure. Very important. Uh, number two is where are we going? And this is about creating, uh, creating a picture about the future, clarity, uh, so important. Uh, and then finally, how we're going to get there, which allows an organization and a team to move forward with great confidence. Uh, one of the things that we did this week is um, we reinforced our core focus and our team uh, consists of employees, but also contractors, educators, uh, coaches, um, uh, members of the production team. So uh, for, for us, our team means um, um, those people that are actively involved in helping for us to move forward our core focus, which is about prosperity and unity and making financial success simple and visual in the beauty and wellness space. Um, we also went through our core values and really anchored in how they, how they um, uh, um, uh, filter our decision makings. Uh, starting with impact, um, respect, and respect really deals with respecting different types of learners, uh, inclusivity, diversion, uh, community, um, the importance of creating and building communities, integrity, which is about being good humans, and then opportunities. And so that's a core value for us because we believe in having a growth mindset. So um, as part of this, we're growing our team. If the, you know anybody that is um, looking for an opportunity, um, we're looking for people as it relates to client success in the school company, um, as well as um, sales support uh, and business development, as well as production. So uh, you can go to our social channels and we have some information on how uh, you could uh, refer someone over there if they're interested in an opportunity. All right, so we have guests today. Uh, if Lauren and Roderick, if you guys could come off the, um, um, or come uh, on screen, there you are. How are you? All good. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. It's good to see you again. We've done this. We did this once before. And um, uh, so good to see you again. Good seeing good you to too. Seen. Good to be seen. Now, I uh, actually, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull my screen up again because I, I have a couple other things here. Uh, I like this picture. I love this picture, by the way, and uh, and then I love this picture too. You get a little more edge to you there, especially Lauren. I mean, I, I love both these pictures. You know, that's and the real us. <laughs> that's the real you. Yes, and um, you know, I, um, I I got your bios after we spent some time together, and I was like, oh my gosh you know, uh, you're, you're legit. I knew you were legit, but Lauren, I didn't know you won Naha twice for goodness sakes. So I had to throw <laughs> that image in there too. Okay. Appreciate so it. Both of you are highly accomplished. Let me please uh, read your bios if that's okay with you. Um, Lauren's enthusiasm and incomparable abilities are responsible for successful rise as one of the most dedicated salon owners and freelance educators in the country. As a curly hair expert and educator, former salon owner, and Naha winner in 2021, and Naha Texture winner in 2015, it's a twice, okay? Lauren's reputation for brilliance is heard around the world. Her ability to adapt to all hair types has created the well-rounded style she is today. Roderick is recognized as a renowned leader in cutting edge educational methods and clipper cutting concepts and techniques, including the current trend of mechanical shear practices as a subject matter expert in the field of barber styling. He raised the bar in personal appearance education. Great backgrounds. I, I had to read that verbatim because I couldn't say it any better. <laughs> We appreciate that, my friend. Thank we, you. Uh, we, we try to do what we can do for the people. <laughs> we, we met in uh, November at the PBA Executive Summit. Um, you were part of a panel main stage, and I was transfixed um, by uh, your contribution to the panel, both of you. And so many different things just jumped out at me. So right afterwards, I went right up to you and said, you got to be guests on my round table. So we met and here we are today. Well, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity. We do. Um, that, that summit was fun. So yeah. it's, it's even more fun to be able to continue connecting with the people that we met there. And also kind of just spreading the message even a little bit further through, you know, podcasts and, and good people like you. So we appreciate you um, having us on. 
Well, thank you. Yes. So you, you're in the school business now as of 2009, 2020. Well, 2019, we opened, but yeah, the the world stopped in 2020. So we had to open again. (laughs) It was like a a do-over. Yeah. Talk about what happened in March of 2020, right? When you were getting ready to get your, um, you're working on your accreditation. So let's, let's go through the timing of that, which, you know, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. We, um, we opened and anyone that's in the school business knows that, you know, NACUS decides when they come and, and they sent us the date and it was on our calendar. And, you know, I think up until that point, we had been hearing COVID here and there, but I don't, I wasn't concerned. I mean, I was like, oh, it's one of those things, you know, um, and they came out on March 10th and, and our last day of school was March 16th. And then on the 17th, all the students were picking up their stuff. So I think we were the last visit uh, mm-hmm. that Naka did like, yeah, I mean, there might've been, you know, others going on at the same time, but I think that was the last week that Naka was even doing them. So, um, <laughs> part of me is like, Oh, well, that would have been fun doing it virtual that, you know, a little less yeah. stressful, but I don't know that it would have been, I think it would have been a little more stressful, at least when they come, you know, what to expect. Whereas if it was virtual, who knows? How that would Roger, happen, one of the things that we talked about was there was a silver lining in that from the perspective that, you know, as a new school and now you have all these schools that are mature, um, how there's a silver lining in that because it kind of leveled the playing field, you know, so that was really interesting. I think part of that, you know, when you're a new location or any new business, uh, your purse strings are a little tighter, right? You're not out spending the same. Every every dollar is like coveted and you're just afraid to spend anything. So our operating costs were pretty low at that point, just, just the nature of where we were at in the process. Um, and so it was very scary for every school, but I think there are schools that had a much higher spending threshold at that point than we did. So just trying to skate by, I think was a little easier given that we had kept our costs so low already at that point because we were just starting out. So it did, I think it did level the playing field a little bit. You've got schools that were used, you know, used to bringing in a hundred, 200,000 a month down to barely anything. Whereas we were kind of used to not bringing in anything. And then we got our, once our accreditation went through and, you know, the, the funding started coming in since we were doing virtual, we were actually making more than we were right prior to the shutdown mm-hmm. before our, our funding was um, approved. So it, it was a weird time, but yeah, I think everybody was sort of on the same level playing field at that point, uh, unfortunately, but you know, as a new school, it was, it was just a different experience. I'm still sort of like, yeah, I'm sure there'll be PTSD coming out of it. Like in five <laughs> years when we realize like what we all went through. Um, you know what, I think we kind of took the approach that opportunities don't go away to go to somebody else. And when you have an opportunity to kind of rewrite the narrative, to kind of do things, do things in a way that's going to be beneficial both for both, you know, your, your staff, but most importantly, your students, I think that's where the real cool opportunity came for us and where we could actually see the server lining because, you know, we quickly shift, we pivot. Um, we went to online um, instead of, you know, doing, you know, leaving our students to their own devices that personal connection and those emotional bonds that we needed to form. We made sure that we had Zoom classes with the students four hours a day, five days a week, just to make sure that we could, you know, kind of calm the situation down because of course it's new for us as business owners, you know, uh, sorry, as school directors. So for us, it was like, well, if we start to panic, then our students start to panic. So we kept it kind of cool and, me- and mellow until we got behind closed doors and oh, well, what we gonna do, you know? And then, uh, but 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 it but it, but it all worked out, and um, we were able to create some create some really really great memories, but also you know put some really new systems in place that actually are super still 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 super effective today um, as we go through our day to day for learning. Now, one of the things that is I I, I think important uh, that relates with that all of us can relate with is the importance of uh, I'll use the word dyads, like dynamic duos, okay? And business happens. Um, there's a great book, by the way. I'm going to kind of go offline, and now I can't even remember the damn name of it. But it was, it was creativity. It was about creativity. And creativity 
uh, happens in, in, in pairs more than anything else. Um, there's example after example of how the best creative works happen in pairs. And in many cases, there was some person that was in the forefront and someone else was behind the scenes. But, um, you know, let's look at Martin Luther King. Um, um, Ralph Abernathy, um, I, I, I think I've got the right person, was as important as Martin Luther King. They just had different lanes. Uh, Gandhi had someone else that was his equal, but there was one voice, you know. So anyway, um, creativity and results come from pairs. So you guys are a, um, a school directors and you're also a, a, a couple. You're married, you have two kids. And um, so, and you have your lanes. Uh, let's go through, and there's certain things that you each other touch and certain things like, yep, don't touch. So Lauren, why don't you start with um, your perspective on the lanes you're in and what, it, what it's like to um, uh, create boundaries. Um, yeah, I think in any relationship, you know, it, communication is always key. And, and uh, Roderick and I dated long distance for two years when we first started dating. And without that open line of communication, we never would have made it through that scenario or that experience. Um, so once we were able to live in the same place, you know, that communication continued and they're not always easy conversations. And a lot of it is just living life and starting to watch how the other reacts to things and, and what makes them tick versus what makes you tick. And, you know, there's definitely a lot of tough conversations because I think human nature, you start to resent other people around you if they don't get as powered up and concerned with the same things that you do. And we started to realize it was actually a gift that we cared about different things. You know, it was a gift that he valued certain things in our life um, being done a certain way. And I valued certain things being done a certain way, but you put them together and it's a whole, right? And then you can accomplish even more when you can take the things that don't make you tick off your plate and give them to somebody that it does make them tick. Um, I, my favorite thing is that I have the best wife ever. You know, we quickly realized that like, having things a certain way at home was definitely his thing. And, you know, he would get resentful and I'm like, look, I don't see it. I, these things that you're worried about, I don't even see them because I'm off like worrying about all these other 10 things that you never have to think about. So I think putting it like that to the other person made a difference because he, you know, kind of looked at me and was like, yeah, you know, you're, you're actually right. And I'm like, you know, I don't get mad at you for the things that you aren't bothered with. Right. Cause it's my job and that's what I do. And so I think over the last decade or so, we've, we've kind of done the ebbs and the flows and figured out what works and driving to work separately works for us. That you know, that's our, that's our moment to like decompress before we get to work and decompress on the way home. I'm a morning person. He's not, he's a night person. So, um, you know, riding to work together and home together just didn't work for us. Even when we had a long commute to our salon before we shut that down, like paying for it, we paid two cars to park every day, but it was one of those things that just made a difference in the way that we operated. And it's always nice to have your best friend and your teammate um, always there to like catch what you don't catch or, or catch you. Roderick, who handles the money? I'm sorry? Who handles the money? Not I, my friend. <laughs> uh, uh, Lauren handles all the money. <laughs> um, I do the, I do the, the child wrangling. Um, so making sure that the kids, um, do their chores, um, dentist appointments, um, making sure that they have, uh, uh, and she gets mad at me for this too, a, a little couple extra dollars spending money and stuff like that. But, um, I think but that money you know, in the business too. So she handles the money in the business. She handles the yeah, money okay. in the business and in our house. She is okay. our financial advisor for the Samuels household. What he means by that is at home and at work, I'm always, who set the heat to this on the thermostat? That's my job. <laughs> Babe, you used <laughs> the wrong credit card again. You're supposed to use the green card, mm -hmm. not the blue one. Um, but I think if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. Um, whether it be relationally or our, our, our partnership in business, um, it's good to have an equal balance of, of both, you know, um, where she's strong, you know, I'm weak and where I'm strong, she's, she, she may be a little bit weaker too. So we, uh, did you guys notice you just got a little scared to call me weak? 
<laughs> he was like, she might be a little less strong in that area. <laughs> if you see me start to duck off like this, it's only because I, I don't want her to throw, throw a jab at me. Um, but you know what though? I can I can honestly say that um that you know running the school to school together as directors, it actually brings us closer. Um, what better way to to spend your life, not just you know, in our marriage, but also in business with someone who you know that 100 percent is going to be your champion, that that understands that you know that you know there, there's going to be good times, there's going to be bad times, but to go through those things with this one person, um, it makes the world a difference. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. Some of the things that um, we spoke about when we were getting to know each other was teaching tolerance. Uh, what, is that, uh, what, what, what does that mean? I mean, I think I know what it means, but there's no way I could possibly articulate it like the two of you. Um, you know, I think it, teaching tolerance in every aspect of life is important. I think especially in this industry, you know, dealing with the public, your tolerance level has to be pretty high for you to be successful in this industry. Um, Tolerance to us, though, is seeing somebody that comes from a different walk of life, maybe a different culture, and instead of judging um, because it's different than, than what you're used to, embracing that and maybe learning a different way of doing things or, or at least understanding what makes people tick and why they do the things that they do. We find that a lot of, um, a lot of what, what is considered racism uh, and obviously this isn't across the board and there are certain racist moments that are fueled by hate in the heart, but a lot of it is just, you live in an area where you're only surrounded by people that are just like you. So you encounter another person from a different race or a different culture and what they do doesn't make sense to you. So it's easy to judge it and say that it's wrong or whatever. Um, and we really believe that if you get to know people that come from something different that, you know, it could really change your life in the way that you look at things. And we have these conversations all the time. Mm -hmm. He grew up in the South as, as an African-American. And I grew up he, up here in Michigan um, as a white, you know, middle-class family. Um, and so there are things that he does that I'm like, I don't, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. But then when you learn the background of it, when you learn historically and and, and from a cultural standpoint, why families make decisions that they make, you kind of go, oh, well, I'm kind of a jerk for thinking, you know, thinking that it was wrong, but I'm married to this man. Like we've been together 10 years and, and I'm still learning things that I'm like, I definitely judged, right? Like I definitely thought, well, that's weird and doesn't make sense. But, you know, being able to have that dialogue um, to learn from each other and from other cultures and other races really makes you a better person um, and, a, and definitely a better school director. Yeah. Um, you know, being able to understand where people are coming from when they come from something different than you, like you can have more empathy and, and you can learn to help people better if you understand their journey than if you just sit back and judge because it's not yours. You know, I think that all learning, I think, um, I think it was like Stephen Covey who said that all learning is understanding and with having the, the, the proper understanding, whether it be um, from a student that may be from, you know, a, a, a low class family or, you know, the student that lives in their car or whatever the case may be, having that understanding builds the tolerance. Building the tolerance builds relationships. And as school directors and educators, you know, that's what our, our, our business is about. It's about building relationships. It's about having empathy. It's about teaching tolerance. So, you know, one of the things that we, we make the, the biggest effort to encourage all school directors all across the country is to get to know their students, not just from a number standpoint or when they, when they fill out their FAFSA. It's about really trying to get to know them and understand them so that you can better serve them. You know, it's about servant leadership for us. And I think that's, that's kind of the point of difference from, you know, what we do here at Hair Lab versus, you know, some of the other schools um, around the country. You know, you used the words cultural divide and um, speak to that. I'll start with you, Roderick. When, you know, when we talk about culture divide, you've got some perspectives on that, which would love to hear. 
Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately, in a lot of the schools, um, you know, we 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 are able to kind of visit schools all across the country before the pandemic, and we see that you know a lot of the the clients that come in for services at schools, you know, the the black clients go to the black students, and the white clients go to the white students, but they're not really getting the proper education to be successful in totality in our industry. It's not about who's right; it's about what's right. And I think that a lot of school directors and, 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 and educators, they want to, they, they, they're not focusing on what's right. What's right is that regardless of what somebody's cultural background is, the color of their skin, your students should still be able to learn and to, to know how to manipulate all types and textures of hair, not colors of skin. So if we take that portion out of it, all the students coming into our industry are going to have a more well-rounded education and that piece of tolerance that we talked about earlier, that's going to come automatically. We got to stop taking the taking the focus on, oh, well, this is a black client or a white client or an Asian client or a Hispanic client versus saying, okay, well, this is the texture of hair that we need to work on. So let me teach my students how to actually do this type of hair. Let me teach my students what they need to know culturally about this person so you can better serve them. Lauren, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, you know, for us, I think one of the biggest things that that we try and do in our school is, and, and things that we've noticed is that students really struggle with problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of asking for help, they just either don't do anything or, you know, make every wrong decision they possibly can. Uh, and we know as school directors and, and school employees that we're held to a standard by our accreditation and by Department of Ed. And Sometimes if we don't know these students are struggling with outside school things, we can't help them get through it. And then it becomes to a point where they've backed themselves into a corner. So even during contracting, I let all these students know, like if you're going through literally anything, you know, and I point out who to talk to, like we have our admissions and financial aid office, but they're great at like emotional support and counseling and pointing you in the right direction. So we each play our role here in supporting these students to get through this program, because some of them, it will change their life just having an opportunity to have a professional license. And it's the one thing they need to literally change the outcome of their life. But without that support, um, they can't make it because they're not getting it at home. They're not getting it outside of there. And they've never been taught how to make good decisions or how to make good financial decisions. And, and so that's where we come in. And it's, it's a full service experience, just because if it's not, we're not doing our job. Well, you know, I think it kind of brings us back to students that are loved at home come to school to learn. And students who aren't loved at home come to school to feel loved. Um, I think a lot of educators take the stand, well, you know, well, this is a bad student, so I'm not going to deal with them. Instead of looking at the problems, let's look at the opportunity. There's a, there's a very unique opportunity that you can have to shape hair and shape these students' lives. Uh, we spend a lot of time, whether it be chasing down students, who's on leave of absence, where are these students, what's going on in their personal lives. And a lot of times students don't like to get personal. However, we find that as being such a big help for us because we don't know what we don't know. So if a student is struggling financially, let's say, you know, the, so and so doesn't have gas money to come to school. Well, let's look at let's 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 make an effort to find some resources to help this student out because them coming to school is a difference between them having a really good day or a really bad day. Them coming to school is like let me take myself out of this bad situation so that I can actually focus on my career and get to the next level in my life. But without looking at it from a, a point where you may not understand life that looks like that, then you can't help them. You know, I uh, when you talk about asking for help, you know, and uh, uh, um, very much relate with that. In fact, when we were creating our financial literacy course, uh, we knew right away that we were going to have a lesson and it's called ask. I mean, it's ask who to ask, how to ask, um, you know, ask for help in terms of professional resources, family, because so many just are, are not given permission to ask for help. And they just, they're not used to it. And usually the difference between, uh, um, or the key to getting unstuck is just to ask. But in many cases, people don't know 
who to ask, how to ask. And so we felt very strongly that when it came to financial literacy, that that was an important, you know, topic to cover. So, um, you know, you, one of the things that uh, we spoke about was um, how you define your, your product in the school, you know, and um, so let, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, I feel really strongly about this. I, I mean, I'm sure Roderick does, but I've been vocal about it since day one. Um, I never went to school. I did an apprenticeship um, and I've taught at many schools over the years doing curly haircutting. A lot of schools would contract us to come in and help them with their barbering and their curly, curly cutting. And, you know, a lot of what I see is the schools are missing the point. You know, there are, our product is truly our educators. Um, without strong educators, your product is not very good. You know, if you think about it from a salon or a barbershop aspect, if you hired a bunch of people that really couldn't cut hair, you know, the product that you're selling is not worth anything. Um, and I see a lot of schools undercutting the instructor pay. Um, you know, I see a lot of people in administration making some really good money and the instructors are making maybe just over minimum wage. Uh, and that's not all schools. There are some schools that really take care of their educators. But, you know, I'm a firm believer that if you want people that are going to add value to what you're selling, like you really need to step up and pay these people what they deserve to be paid. Otherwise, you're going to end up getting only the people that flunked out of the industry that maybe went and worked in a shop for a couple of weeks and maybe they're not driven or maybe they didn't sit long enough or they don't have any networking skills or uh, whatever it was that made them not successful behind the chair where they're looking at $12 an hour, like they hit the jackpot. Those aren't the people that I want as my product, right? Like I don't want the ones that never could make it. I think that it's so important to value the people that are working on the front, the front lines of the mm -hmm. school, you know, they're the ones interfacing with students all day. They're the ones that are ultimately, um, they're going to reflect the job that you did. And so I think putting a heavier, heavier weight on what we're paying our instructors is everything. Well, we see the turnover rate um, in a lot of um, employees and, you know, barber and cosmetology schools, you know, um, and the only way to kind of bounce back from that is to hire someone uh, just, just fresh out of school, you know, and, and I'm not saying that you you don't have value coming straight out of school and be able to deliver, you know, uh, information or education. However, if if the ink on your 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 barber's license or cosmetology <laughs> license hadn't even dried yet, you're going to have students looking at you like, so what can you teach me, you know? So right. understanding the value that the instructors bring to the table, the, the day in, the day out, they're dealing with headaches, they're dealing with the students' personal problems, they're dealing with pushback every day. Um, I think it's important to give them a fair wage so you can keep those good people around. Right, right. Um, you know, um, Hold on just one second here. I've got a I've got a dog that's uh, precariously close to interrupting us. So <laughs> we've all dealt with that before, right? Don't worry uh, about it. We got our students are doing a barber battle right on the clinic floor right now. So if y'all hear some loud music and stuff like that, don't don't mind it. We just it's, it's rattling my office right now. So they <laughs> must be having a really good time. Okay, tell us what a barber battle is. Oh, so um, so. Lauren and I, um, you may not know this, but we're very competitive, um, not only with each other, but also, you know, we compete on a national and international level with photograph competitions. Uh, so we look at competition between our students as being very, very important. Um, it helps them to kind of level up and see like, you know, who's learning the best techniques, who's great at theory, who's great at technical skills. So we do a combination of um, theory uh, competitions. We had a cahoots tournament um, a few a few weeks ago, and we had uh, it was broken into two students at a time. Um, and now we're doing a barber battle where we have four students competing against each other, um, which kind of goes into you know the realm of Lauren and I with the photographs. So they do a haircut on a client. They uh, they have forty five minutes. They actually take the client, shampoo the hair, they style it, they shoot it. And then we take the photos and put them on our Instagram and have the our Instagram followers vote on them to see who wins. 
So we do that like once a month. Yeah, we do. We do a different fun event every month. Last last month they did a shark tank. So they had to put together Mm -hmm. a business. Um, it's like start to finish, like all of it. And then they had to pitch it, uh, to the panel. And then the panel decided who did the best presentation and had the best concept. Um, so we try and mix it up and get them to be a little competitive. I don't know that they love it as much as we do the competitive part, but <laughs> I keep trying every month I started. To, well, we do progress reports every month. So I started ranking them. Mm-hmm. So they'll see their attendance ranking and then their academic ranking within the school. And my thought was, well, if you're like at the bottom, you're really going to start like trying to get those numbers up. Uh, we've been doing it about three months. So I'm watching them and it's pretty interesting to see. You can see the ones that are like competitive and they're not having any of it and they'll just keep plugging away. But um, I explained to them that when you get out into the shops that you're going to be competing for clients with those around you. So it's always important to see where your, uh, where your performance is landing um, amongst your peers. So that's kind of where the ranking came in, but we'll, we'll see how that ends up. Yeah. We like so to have you, fun with it. you guys said yesterday that um, um, uh, Roderick doesn't touch the money and uh, Lauren doesn't touch the social media. So I'm going to ask you, Roderick, tell us how we find you on social. Uh, so you can find me on social, um, on Instagram. It's at Roderick Samuels, R-O-D-R-I-C-K-S-A-M-U-E-L-S. Um, you can find me also, I started a new Instagram page called Teaching Barbers is My Jam. Um, I wanted to try to give some insight to educators all across the country about some of the cool things that we're doing in our school, um, like the Cahoots tournament, the barber battles, things like that, but also a different perspective on 21st century education. Um, Lauren and myself, um, we, we felt it necessary also to kind of show, um, I think a lot of times people think when they see Lauren and myself, they look at us, us as Hollywood, but we're actually neighborhood, you know? So we still have- My glasses don't say that, but I really am. <laughs> we splurged a little bit on the glasses because my, my baby can't see y'all. She couldn't <laughs> see. Um, so um, so we started a new Instagram page there as well. And it's uh, called Sheer Love. Um, and it kind of takes everybody through like our day, day-to-day uh, life with our kids and teaching and hair shows and stuff like that. So um, it's pretty cool, but it's Roderick Samuels all across the board, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Snapchat, um, Twitter. Where do we find the barber uh, battle though? What's that? Where, do Where we are you going to be posting the pictures of the oh, barber Oh, it'll battle? be on our Hair Lab Detroit. Um, it's at Hair Lab Detroit Barber School on Instagram. As soon as we get off this, we'll be going live. So if anybody wants to tune in, uh, they can take a look. All right. Uh, let's, uh, we're going to move up and we're going to move into uh, freeing you up. I've taken so much of your time today because you were guest earlier today. And um, I've, I've got a couple things for each of you. So, you know. Well, if you don't mind, Tom, just one other thing. I wanted to share Lauren's social media as well. Um, she. Um, Depends on where you're at. Yeah. Uh, a Lauren M. Mosier on Instagram. And then I think I'm a, a Lauren Samuels on Facebook. Um, you know, I'm straddling all my names at this point. So it depends on where I'm at. Sorry but, about um, the mess. We, sh- we should have, we sh- I should have, I, I didn't mean to exclude you on that. Anyway, go ahead. No, it's okay. Happy wife, happy life, brother. <laughs> I, I, I learned that. Um, I learned that a long time ago. Thank you from my mother. Uh, anyway, uh, Lauren, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes out there today. And, um, you know, certainly um, you winning Naha twice in the field of textured hair, um, certainly, and I think you addressed this on stage, people will make an assumption about, you know, skills and what have you, uh, quite an accomplishment and, and, and quite a perspective. So congratulations. So uh, the stereotypes and you really, your success in, in textured hair. Uh, it's been an interesting ride. You know, I started doing here in the nineties when everyone was flat ironing. And so the curly education just wasn't there, but I've always been, you know, drawn to curly hair. I'm in a very diverse area. Um, Michigan is a melting pot. So we've got heavy uh, Latino population and uh, Middle Eastern population and African American population. So there's a lot of different textures going on. And I never felt comfortable calling myself a professional when there were things out there that I just didn't feel comfortable doing. So um, I sort of made it my mission to figure it out. And because there was no education, um, I just had to teach myself. So a lot of it was trial and error and finding people that were willing to give honest feedback and let me work on it. Um, And then the people make an appointment with you and they walk in and they go, oh, 
I didn't know you looked like that. I'm like, oh, I was expecting something different. So with my fine straight hair, they would, you know, start to panic. But luckily, because of the way that I figured it out and taught myself, I could approach it with some confidence that most people don't have. I mean, I was never afraid or or concerned that I was going to let these people down. So I think being able to sit with them and explain like how I got to where I am and and also explaining to them what I was going to do to their hair and, and what my plan was, um, it would instantly diffuse the situation and and they would give me a chance. And then, you know, the next thing you know, they're like sending everyone they know. And so it snowballs, but it's definitely something that I've had to deal with. And I think later in my career, again, I, I was confident. So it wasn't as, uh, as disturbing, but I think as a younger stylist, those, those things are hard. They're mm -hmm. very hard because I think it's natural to second guess yourself when you haven't been doing it that long. Um, but to get to that point where you're like, no, 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 I've got this, have a seat, you know, it, it feels good. So I think, and that, that applies to anybody and anything that you want to do, um, you know, just dedicate yourself to getting good at it. And then no one can tell you otherwise. Well, well, well said, Roderick, we got to hear a little bit about, um, Lauren's background. She talked about being middle-class Michigan and it, you have a very different upbringing, um, you, this came out when you brought up something called, uh, uh, how I made it over. Um, and I, I, I hadn't heard that before many people had, you know, but talk a little bit about your background and some of your roots and, and how that really fuels who you are today as a human. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm originally from Somerville, South Carolina. Um, my mom was an educator in the public school system for 33 years. Um, my dad uh, is career long truck driver. So I kind of get a little bit of the academia and the blue collar, um, which, you know, worked out in my favor pretty good, I believe. Um, I'm a son of my dad is also um, a pastor. So um, um, normally when we would go to church, he would sing the so song called How I Made It Over, or How I Got Over. And basically what it was, was it was a testament to the trials and tribulations that he had growing up, you know, in the in the 50s and 60s with segregation and all these other things and being able to, to raise a family and, 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 and see his kids go to, well, not me, but see my sister go to college and, <laughs> and me become a barber and, and, and an entrepreneur later on in life. So um, it, it resonates to me because I think that when people see, it, when when people see problems, they never seek solutions. It's always woe is me and they live in this negative mindset and, and they just live in there. Well, if I can call on you know, the, the, the upbringing of my dad and my mom and, and, and how they made it over, it instills, you know, it instills just this, this drive and determination in me, regardless of what the circumstance is, that I can make it over to. And that's something that we actually push out to our students too. If you change the way your students look at things, the things they look at will change. And instead of seeing you know, the problems, we ask them to see the opportunities that are afforded to them. There's always, Lauren says it all the time, um, there's never a problem without a solution. And that's how she got her upbringing from her mom and her dad. So um, even though we come from different areas and different spectrums, and of course, with different different uh, ethnicities, bringing these two things together, I think that it helps to balance us. Um, you know, we're raising kids together, but also, um, you know, helping to build business together and build great barbers and stylists to come into our industry and make a difference too. You guys have been great, great guests. Uh, let's everybody give them a virtual round of applause. Uh, give them a little bit of a shout in the chat there. Uh, I would love to um, recognize you. I've already did this earlier today. Million Dollar Light Bulb. Um, uh, welcome you to our Brain Trust. Uh, this will be forthcoming for you. So uh, thanks again. What a what a great uh, uh, a great opportunity to spend time with both of you. Thanks for sharing your heads and hearts with us. So thanks Thank so much for having so much. us. Y'all have a great day. All right. Well, listen, I, um, uh, I'm going to pull up a couple, uh, whoops, I've got to pull something up here so we can, we can uh, close this here. If you'll just give me a second, everybody. Uh, I'm so inspired getting to spend time with these guys twice in one day. And um, all right, what else do we have before we wrap up? Um, whoops, uh, this is, I started at the wrong place. Uh, let's go with schedule. 
Uh, we are on again next week. And um, hold on one second. Let me get me back to where we were. Okay. Uh, we are on again next week. Uh, and then we're off twice in February. Michelle's going to put it up in the chat. I believe that we're out on the uh, February 9th. And then we must be out on the 21st, I believe, are the two dates. Um, so we welcomed both Roderick and Lauren to our brain trust. Um, certainly got some light bulb moments from these guys, of course. Uh, we will be celebrating both of them and other members of our brain trust on Sunday, May 15th, down in Scottsdale. Um, we'll be acknowledging and recognizing, and all these members of the brain trust will be invited and acknowledged. We also will be recognizing um, uh, select individuals with the golden light bulbs. Uh, this will be a Beauty Changes Lives fundraiser. Uh, mark your calendar, May 15th in Scottsdale. Uh, that's going to be part of an event that we'll refer to as the fill, um, which is an opportunity to fill your bucket and to fill the gaps in your business. So save that date. Um, also this weekend, uh, there's a conference in New Orleans. Uh, it's called Serious Business. It's live. And there's also an opportunity to experience it uh, virtually. Erin um, will be presenting at that and she'll be sharing several things from our money curriculum as well as some light bulb moments that we've learned through the years. So anyway, we hope you'll become a money school. Go to communityforschools.com to book a demo. Uh, closing thoughts, uh, I started out this way. Always believe something wonderful is about to happen. Uh, certainly some wonderful things happened today by virtue of the great sharing of our guests. Uh, we hope you have a great rest of the week. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, whether you're joined us live or whether you're gonna watch this on YouTube, uh, thanks again for spending your precious ATM with us, your attention and time, no money needed. Bye now.